Uh, we're Chef, going to be talking about infrastructure agnostic application automation uh, with Habitat. All right, so this is my intro slide, so I didn't really count. Yeah. So, Ignites, they're fun, huh? Uh, so, I'm here today to talk about uh, a new project from Chef called Habitat. Um, hopefully, the slides will are running. There we go. So, Habitat is application automation. You're familiar with Chef for configuration management. Well, Habitat is application automation to enable the build, deployment, and management of any application, any environment, whether it's you know, cloud, containers, doesn't matter to us. Um, it came out of our experiences with Chef and Docker. One of the things we realized early on was that Chef inside of Docker is the wrong pattern. When you start talking about immutable infrastructure, you're not talking about an agent managing uh, containers. You want to build those packages up uh, externally. But as we started to get in this ecosystem, we realized that there was a lot of things that people had overlooked about how you run applications in containerized environments. Uh, a lot of people, when they get that container, you say, hey, where did that come from? How did it get built? And they're like, oh, I tagged it. Well, what version of OpenSSL was it compiled against? So people don't really know what's going on inside their applications, and they're not well behaved. And so stepping back, we said, hey, let's, let's start a new project. And what it does is it takes the source dependencies, builds packages them, and tests them, and produces immutable artifacts. It starts with a habitat plan that is how your application is built. It comes with scaffolding for standardized Go, Java, Node, Ruby applications, so they're always built the same way. What you end up with is a plan. A plan is how you build your application. The plan is written in Bash because that's how people build software on Linux. Um, this is an example of a more complicated one for Redis. This is all there is to it. Uh, downloads the code, builds the package, defines the build dependencies, which version of GCC and make, but also the runtime dependencies. Packages all those up together in a studio. So the Habitat Studio is an immutable, uh, uh, reproducible build environment, an empty Docker container that compiles your application and produces a, uh, a package that can then be pushed to an uh, application repository. It can be exported to Docker, right? So we have an immutable artifact that tells you how that application is managed. We can send it straight to Docker. We also support other formats like uh, Cloud Foundry. So if you want to deploy it on Pivotal Cloud Foundry, that's an option. Or if you want to put it on Mesos, or Kubernetes, or you just want to take your application and run it on any Linux file system, you can do that with Habitat. You have an artifact that is portable across all those things. The reason it's portable is it takes its configuration from the environment. When you talk about 12-factor apps, that's one of the keys. Uh, you define all the configuration options in a TOML file. It gets exposed through an API. The Docker, you can pass it in through the environment, or you can push things directly to the API of the process supervisor. The process supervisor is managing that application, how it starts, stops, reconfigures, has an API for taking configuration, but you can also query it and say, what version of OpenSSL were you compiled against? You can ask your application that sort of stuff. It has a service discovery ring that allows you to manage clustering. So you can do leader election, how your applications get deployed, how those applications talk to other applications. So it actually can handle update strategies and roll out upgrades of your applications you know, uh, as, you, as you go. Of course, Kubernetes is the logical place that you know, things seem to be headed towards. We have a native uh, Kubernetes operator that allows you, that understands topology and groups and brings you know, the Habitat built packages straight in. Um, we just launched a build service, which is a SaaS offering that allows you to take your Git commits uh, and automatically generate builds of your packages and push those to the Docker Hub anytime your application or its dependencies change. We have over 500 packages already on the, the, uh, the build repository. Of course, we also added Windows support. You don't build your applications with Bash, you build them with PowerShell. There's a nato, native Windows supervisor, ASP.NET. Whoa, lost my screen. Is that screensaver kick in? Windows support. Windows support. <laughs> Windows support. OK, there we go. So it's got ASP.NET uh, Core, .NET Core, Node, Ruby, Go, already working on Windows. Uh, Steve Morosky, where are you? He was one of the, the contributors to it, uh, still working on it at Microsoft. It's a 12-factor application framework. We want to decouple your application from your operating system and separate your build from your deploy so your applications are portable, they get their configuration from the environment, and you're building immutable artifacts. Developers love this. They can build in any language and always have the latest up-to-date uh, dependencies. They get automatic builds on commit, and they get stable and unstable release channels, so they can push those out. You know who else likes that? Operators, because they get 
the same automated container builds. They get reproducible artifacts that are immutable. They get uh, release channels, and they get consistent management of their applications, whether it's in Kubernetes, running on a Linux file system, or on Windows. Uh, so Habitat is completely open source, Apache licensed, which means you do whatever you want with it. It's up on GitHub. Uh, it's got a lot of active development from the community. Uh, we've got 189 pull requests from non-chef employees, 37 non-chef employees are contributing, and over 6,000 uh, core package releases this year. So that's Habitat. Thank you. That's experience. What's it name? Habitat is written in Rust. In what? Rust. Oh, okay. If you want to talk about the code base, happy to later. Yeah, we can talk later. Come on, <laughs> this on. Oh, yeah, you're going to have fun here because oh, this gosh. gets in the way. Oh, Just gosh. plug it right on the beard. Oh, it's it's yeah, it doesn't work. Plug it. We'll try that before. Oh, 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 that's fine by me. Static. I'm good. Here we go. We have the next one uh, by Rob Sewell. That's he right. He delivered to the PowerShell gallery in five minutes. Okay. Are we on? Yes. So, uh, come on. <laughs> So I failed to do this demonstration in one hour in London. So five minutes, here we go. So PowerShell is really important for DevOps. So let's make sure that we do it in the right way. What we're going to do is deliver our modules to the PowerShell gallery continuously. So I get up, I drink some coffee. I think I must create a continuous delivery process for delivering modules to the PowerShell gallery in five minutes. There's not going to be much time for any detail here. Sorry. We need to have modules because we don't want scripts everywhere. We want to be able to make sure that all of everything that we've got is available to be used by anybody in our organization. And maybe sometimes we're in order to export the functions that the people need. We use PowerShell Gallery because it's a centralized repository. The public one is safe and secure, and a private one gives us more control over what we allow people to use. What do we need? Plaster. Install module Plaster. Pester, even though you've already got it. Install module Pester with a force to get the latest version. We're also going to have GitHub, because source control is important, and VSTS, because we need to build and we need to deploy. And all of that is free. Costs you nothing, with some caveats with GitHub and VSTS, but it's free. So Plaster enables us to template a framework for our modules. We can build our folders, we can build our files, we can add parameters. The magic happens in the manifest file. Everything that you want to define is put in there, and then you create yourself a template. You call it with invoke plaster, you splat out the parameters, or you answer some prompts, depending on what you want to do. And it looks just like this. A pretty picture. And here I am, I'm creating some folders, I'm creating some files. I'm not answering any prompts because I gave all of those parameters dynamically ahead of time. <coughs> now we need to write some code. So we're going to use test-driven development. We're going to use Pester. We're going to write our test. We're going to run our test. We're going to fail our test. We're going to write our code. We're going to run our test. We're going to pass our test. We're going to repeat that ad infinitum until we have something that we are able to deliver to the gallery. <coughs> so we want to make sure that we've got a test for starting a process. We've written our test, it's failed. We'll write some code, we'll run our test again. Green is good, everything's brilliant. Now the reason that you should use VS Code for editing and creating your PowerShell is because it works really well with Git, as you can see here. You write a good commit message, that wasn't a good commit message. And then you push to the VSTS or to GitHub, and hooray, our build agent starts. Now we're starting our build. And what our build is going to do is it's going to grab our code out of GitHub. It's going to run the pest test that we've already set. It's going to publish them up to VSTS. And then it's going to move our files, create our artifacts, push them up to the server ready for us. 
because we're interested in DevOps, we've got a nice build, we can share all of our measurements. Here are the measurements for our pest tests. Everybody can see the history of what we've done with our development. And then we have a release. So a release, we need to update our version number in our module manifest. Otherwise, the PowerShell gallery is going to go, nip eh. So we can do that in PowerShell. We can add some release notes. Please read the release notes in a minute. And then we're going to publish to the PowerShell gallery just some PowerShell code. And we've got some nice log files. So you can see everything that's going on. Everybody can see what's happening. The entire organization can see whether you're writing your PowerShell code and passing your tests correctly. Everybody has some input. VSTS enables us to have some nice dashboards. So you can see nice pretty green pictures. We can have traffic lights that move up and down when builds are happening. Everybody can see the history and the length of time that things have happened. And then, after that's done, it appears in the gallery. In the PowerShell gallery, install module, bid analysis, because that's an important thing to make sure you write PowerShell for. You can see the release notes. You can see that it was demoed in five minutes at Singapore for that particular version. And now, all of you in this room know that continuous delivery of PowerShell modules to the gallery is really easy. Blester is your templating. Tester is your unit testing framework. VSTS is free. Have fun. Create some PowerShell modules today. Thank you. We have some very powerful animation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you, Rob. So our next speaker actually is uh, continuing on the same topic. Okay, on okay, well, uh, David is preparing his talk. It was about extreme automation. He's from Pivotal. Right, and uh, hold on just a second. Okay, I'll go back. Okay. <coughs> All right. I'll just stick it right there. Can you hear me okay? Nope. So you need to use this. Ah, okay. Got it. Testing? Okay, I'll press it every 15 seconds. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Okay, hold on, hold on. All right. Hi, I'm David Varvel. I'm the director of Pivotal Labs in Singapore, and today I'm going to be talking about extreme automation. Um, it's a little more high level. It's kind of a checklist of all the things that can be automated in your, in your system. Um, all this is talking from uh, real customer experience. These are some of the customers we've worked with across a wide variety of industries, and we're seeing a lot of these benefits. Um, in the beginning, there were computers. And computers are really cool because they can do a whole lot of stuff way faster than humans, and they're also really good at repetitive tasks, which means they're great at automation. A while back, people figured out they could virtualize computers, and now we have these IaaS platforms where you can automatically set up, configure, tear down computers, and you kind of have computers build computers. You can also have computers build networks programmatically, uh, and you can build whole data, whole data centers. Um, <laughs> CI is also pretty central to automation. Uh, the job of a CI server is really just a fancy task runner, and uh, often it's used to run unit tests, linters, those kinds of things. You can also use CI to automatically deploy, so CI, CD, and that's usually where most people stop, but you can do a lot more. You can add a lot of different tasks into CI. Here's an example of a concourse CI pipeline. Um, each one of those green boxes is a task, and as long as it's running tests, it's also automatically generating environments and doing things with those environments. 
One of the really interesting things that it's doing is uh, security scans. So you can insert things like HP Fortify into your CI pipeline and automatically do all your automated security tests, including uh, input fuzzing and black box testing at, on each deploy. You can also do load testing in CI. Uh, load testing, <laughs> if you have virtualized infrastructure, is really cool because you can, you can have CI build a whole environment, do load tests in that environment, and then tear it down when you're done. I want to talk for a moment uh, now about 12-factor app stuff. Uh, all these principles are important, but I really want to drill into the dependencies piece of 12-factor apps. Uh, 12, in 12 factor apps, your, your app is the, the kid on top of that pyramid. Um, if you look at all of your dependencies, the code in your dependencies vastly outweighs the amount of code in your application most of the time. You want to have your CI be able to do security scans of all of the dependencies in your application and be able to detect CVEs and potentially auto upgrade if necessary. Um, <coughs> You also want your infrastructure, after you deploy, to be able to do automatic routing, automatic network configuration, automatic uh, DNS configuration, and set, set it up so that all things go to, your, go to your deployed applications automatically. Load balancing, once you do that, becomes very easy. You should never have to manually configure load balancers. That should come along free for the ride with your routing layer, and that should, should all be entirely automated. Your platform should also do automatic health checks on your application. Is it up? Is it running? Is it doing everything it's supposed to do? And will it stand it up if it falls over? Now, if you do all of these things, if you automate all of these things, these are the kind of benefits that you see. And these are the kind of numbers that we are seeing in actual customer situations. Um, your, your operators, if you're dealing with a fully automated infrastructure, should not really care how many apps you're running or what apps you're running. And if you're a developer, you should be completely abstracted away from all of that operation, operational stuff. So here is my code. Run it in the cloud for me. I do not care how. And you should have confidence that your code is going to do all of the right things in the cloud because it went through that CI pipeline. I'm always looking for new things to automate. There's a lot of interesting uh, things with security, with automated compliance and highly regulated environments. Happy to talk about that stuff afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to dive deeper into this with, uh, with any, any of you who are around. And this is how to get a hold of me. Thank you very much. I cheated for a bit. Uh, please forgive me. <laughs> um, but this is what happens when the slides are sent uh, a few minutes before the talk. So uh, you need to uh, make this. Hello. Are you ready? Sure. Get Everyone it. had a fail start. You got this all uh, automated? Yes. I, I noticed you were automated before. That was cool. Yeah, that's all right. So you, you guys already know who I am. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about AppSec. This is my love. Uh, I, I'm really passionate about this space because I don't think we do a good enough job about it. So uh, I would love to talk about this more afterwards. Uh, the software that we write is full of holes, is full of problems, really stupid stuff when you look at it like this. Hard-coded passwords, bad crypto. Uh, I mean, we're just not doing a good job of securing our applications. Most attacks happen through the application layer, right? It's not necessarily software we build, it's software we buy, or maybe it's open source that we stand up on the edges of our network. There is risk everywhere, and largely we get in through the application. So here's some key ones, and there's obviously one missing, the, the, the recent breach. But you hear people talk about, I'm going to secure the most important applications. Well, Target got breached through uh, an HVAC contractor's billing website. Um, Equifax, 
again, I don't think they knew where to patch. I don't think that they knew that they were vulnerable until afterwards. Uh, when they came back and did the forensics, said, oh my God, but look, you know, CIO, CEO, CISO, all fired. As we talk about technologies, we do things the hard way in Waterfall because we only do it once a year and we never get that payback. As you get towards DevOps, you have to automate the world. Um, I love this quote from Nathan Harvey. Uh, this is the one that I've glued myself to. It's about changing your entire organization, right? If my support guy picks up the phone and, so, and the customer says, hey, the thing that you just shipped is broken, they say, what thing? We have to train everybody. Security's often sitting on the outside of the scrum team looking in going, geez, I hope they're doing the right thing. I, I, I really can't tell. I don't understand the process. They don't invite me. And they end up fighting for budget. Here's 10 things that need to get fixed. Maybe they get one or two. AppSec programs look like gates or look like the sea snow, right? The guys standing on the bridge saying, you guys can't ship. Uh, it doesn't lead to good results and it doesn't make us feel good about security. They're not being a partner with us and they need to be. So the outcomes are either, you know, there's a gate, but I just drive around it, or I call my boss who tells me I can drive around it, or there really is a gate and we crash into it. So you talk about your highly regulated environments. This is what happens there. Neither of those is a good outcome. So the strategy, and you're going to hear me talk about this again, it's mostly about the people. The problem with software is the people that write it and the people that test it. Do you know, if you're a developer, do you know your peer in security? If you're in security, do you know your peer in development? If you don't, then you should. You need to build those relationships. Those are key. It's not, hey, those security people. No, it's Lisa and security or Bob and security. Uh, you need to make that relationship because what we want is accountability. We want to be measured as a team, security and development together, about the software that we build. Make it part of our goals. People don't do it because they're not gold to do it. They're gold to release software quickly. So if you look at an automated pipeline, we need to have tools that we run before check-in that are exactly the same as what we run after check-in. So if you've got a CI CD pipeline and you've got testing in there and the developers can't take the test before they ship, then the pipeline is always broken. Now, one thing that we've measured in our state of software security is around a couple of key things. One of them is training. If we give them and give the developers tools to train on, six times better and six times faster. For you, it's about doing some reading. You have to understand how software is built today if you are a security professional, right? So when I talk to security people, it's about reading the Phoenix Project. And if anyone in the room hasn't read that yet, it should be required reading. You have to do that. Um, helping developers fix what they find. So as developers, we have never been trained in this. We need to get trained and we need someone to help us. If they do that, we're gonna be faster because of it. We shouldn't be brailing around the internet trying to figure it out. This is the talk I just gave, by the way, Security Champions Program. Eyes and ears of security, getting some specialized training, um, being the people in the room during the grooming sessions to talk about security, to make sure it's front and center, that we're talking about it while we're planning it. So training throughout, running static analysis the second you start writing code, in your IDE, uh, running develop dynamic testing all the way into production because of the configuration drift, which we heard about today. That's a real thing. In the end, it's about us making a partnership, right? It's about us taking training, us getting training, uh, the security team coming in being a partner and not a boss, right? Because at the end of the day, our, our business cards all say the same company name on them, and that's what we need to react to, the fact that we're doing right by the company. But until our bosses take it seriously and make it part of our goals, we won't do the right things. Thank you very much.